Okay. Are you ready for the power of positivity? Yes. Awesome. So it's very easy when you start talking about positivity to get a little bit lost. I should turn on the clock. It's very easy when you talk about an, a subject like this to start uh, telling people off for their lack of positivity. But that would be cynical, so I'm going to try to avoid doing that. Although, certain comparisons are particularly powerful. But if I were to ask you, what was the first thing... It's not on. If I were to ask you, what's the first skill that you can train, you can teach your child? Your child is born in a hospital, and the first skill that you can possibly train your child is to smile. Think about that. Your child is born within an hour. Let me turn that side. Within an hour, the child is capable of looking at its mother and father. A little short while after that, the child is capable of recognizing its parents' voice. Not long after that, a child is capable of the initial process of being able to mimic its parents child is in this world for a few hours and starting to be capable of mimicking its parents. So if you smile at your child enough, this is what you'll get. It's my son, by the way. <laughs> this is my son at one month old. You can smile at your child as much as you possibly can, and this is what your child will do. And it's the first thing that you can teach your child, the first skill developmental milestone that you can achieve with your child. So one of the fundamental parts of positivity in relation to chinuch and in general in life is the concept of a paradigm shift. So there's a few different examples that are given for what a paradigm shift is. There's one that you can say, there's a story in the Gemara, the Gemara tells us in Shabbos about a worker who could, not, who could not get paid. And he went over to his boss and he said to his boss, where's my money, I need to get paid. And it was right before Yantiv. And his boss said, listen, I'm sorry, I don't have the money. So he said, pay me in karka, pay me in metalpolin, pay me in animals and food and produce. Pay me in some form, at least I can go home and feed my children. And his boss said, I'm sorry, I can't help you. So eventually he turned to his boss and he said, give me pillows and blankets so I can keep my children warm. And his boss said, no. At this point, he turned around and he went home. <coughs> But what were his options? You know, think about it. You're standing at the customer service counter, lost, bag, lost baggage counter at the, in JFK, right? Or LaGuardia is probably a better example because it's more frustrating, right? <laughs> and you're standing there, and they lost their things, and they didn't, you know, they're not taking care of you. And our first reaction is always to get upset. But it's not productive. And actually, it causes the brain to shut down. So instead of getting upset, he went home. And a few days after Yom his boss shows up with three donkeys laden with food, drink, other uh, delicacies, and he pays him the full money. And he says to him, by the way, when I told you that I couldn't pay you, what were you thinking? And he goes through piece by piece each request that he made in order to help him ask for um, his, his, his pay. And for each one, the employee said, I had a positive thought, and he explained what the positive thought was. And the last part, he says, when you asked for pillows and blankets, what did you think of me? 
And he said, I thought maybe you gave all of your wealth, your considerable wealth, to Tzedakah. You gave everything to Hektish. So he turns, the boss turns to the employee, and he says to him, that's exactly what happened. My life has been upside down lately. My son is in a terrible place. He gave up on learning Torah. I don't know what to do. My whole world is upside down. And I couldn't function. I was maktish everything I owned to Kredish, to Hektish. And then I came to my senses and I realized that this is not going to help me out. This is not going to fix the problem. And I did the uh, Atarus and and I had my money back and I was able to pay you. The Mepharshim tell us that this story is not two simple, regular people. The employee was Rabbi Kiva bin Yosef, the great Rabbi Kiva in the Gemara. And the teacher and the, and the, the, uh, the employer, the what? The employer. The person who, the employee was Rabbi Kiva. The employer was the Yosef bin Horkinus. When we have a tendency that when we look at stories like that, when we look at experiences like that, we tend to say, okay, these are tzaddikim. But the Gemara doesn't point out who they are. Because these are practical lessons that we can learn. But here's the other example of a paradigm shift. And here's the opposite example. Two people are sitting in an airport. They're both reading a newspaper. And each time, you know, in between the pages, this fellow sticks his hand into the bag sitting on the chair in between him and the other person, and he pulls out a cookie and he begins to eat. So, the person sitting next to him, a complete stranger, does the same thing. Sticks his hand into his bag, pulls out a cookie and begins to eat. So you think, that's weird. Why is he eating my cookies? So, he takes another cookie, and the guy takes another cookie. He takes another cookie, the guy takes another cookie. Until he finishes, he finishes the bag, he finishes his uh, newspaper, the guy, the guy next to him finishes his newspaper, folds it up, leaves, there's half a coat, there's one cookie left, he cracks it in half, takes half of it, eats it, leaves the other half there, and he walks off. And if I were to show you what the guy's face began to look like, inside, he's just burning up inside. Why is this happening? Why is he eating my cookies? And then he realizes, he opens up his bag, and he realizes he was eating the other guy's cookies the whole time. That's what you call a paradigm shift. With one tiny detail of information, the emotion goes from anger to remorse. Nothing changed in the story. The cookies didn't reappear. He didn't speak to the other person. He just got a little bit of information. And when he got that little bit of information, everything changed. So when we think about other people, when we think about our children, and people in our community, and people around us, our children's teachers, anyone around us, what do we think about? It's interesting that the Mishnah Perkyovis says, Don es kol ha'adam. There are those who explain kol ha'adam means the whole person, not just all people. But when you talk to a person, you're about to judge him, you see something happening, don't just think about that person in the isolation of the incident that you see in front of you, but think about the entire experience. What was his childhood like? What's happening around him? What's happening in his home? You have no idea what the story is. In fact, one of the fundamental processes in learning is destruction. On a simple basis, if you're trying to build a house, you want to build a bigger house, you knock down the house that's there, you build a bigger one. When your child learns to count, or learns a pasukhomish, or learns colors, or anything that they learn, every time they learn something new, they have to destruct their old model of what they know to be true, and they have to build a new one. Right? So if a child learns Pashas Bereshis, he has to now learn that there are more, more vocabulary, there are more parshias, and more parts to learning. If a child knows how to count from 1 to 10, they have to know that outside of 1 to 10, 
there's more than that. So there's a certain, we tend to, after we learn something, we tend to say, okay, this fits nicely into a box in my head. I'm going to keep it that way. But then we realize that there's more. You have to erase a little bit of what's there in order to make space for the new. And it's funny that when we look at behavior, we tend to think about it different than the way we think about academic skills. So academic skills, I just described to you, that you have to destroy something in order to make it greater. But when we think about behavioral skills, we don't tend to think about it that way. That if a child is misbehaving or a child is doing something that they shouldn't be doing, we have to recognize that that temporary moment of destruction, that ability to erase what they know to be true, needs to occur in order for the next stage to exist. And so, when we judge our children, when a child comes into our room, or if a child comes to, to, to a teacher, and the child says, Chaim was bothering me. And the first step is that we go to the other child and we say, why did you do that? We skip a step. We skip a step of finding out what happened. We skip a step of giving the child the opportunity to say, let's learn from what happened and let's grow. Because mistakes are how learning ha happens. The Rebbe talks about this concept of people in challenging situations or mistakes. And essentially the Rebbe says, who do you think problems are for? Well, who, do you think hard th who do you think makes hard things happen to you? If a child is challenged in a classroom and having a hard time figuring out behavior, who do you think made that happen? If a parent or an adult, if a teacher, if a person around us is experiencing a complicated situation and they're making a mistake, something is going wrong, who do you think caused that to happen? It was Hashem. It was, Hashem created this. Hashem created this difficulty for this person. So if you have a difficulty for a person, you have to stop looking at it as a problem or a mistake or a bad thing and you have to t turn around and say, this is an Isayin. This is a way for this person to grow. And Hashem trusts this person to be able to do this task, so I should also. So, before I finish, I just want to wrap up with a story. And I was once, I once, went, once went to a, a workshop and uh, this is how I heard them describe the relationship between teachers, parents, and, and, uh, and kids. The children think the school and the parents are nuts. The school thinks the children and the, and the parents are nuts. right? And the parents think the children and the school are nuts. It's not 100% true, but there's a tendency to say that group over there, these people, the other side, they also describe it in a school, in a classroom, right? Teacher, principal, child, right? We have, in, in Yiddishkeit, we call this that you can't judge someone until you're in their place. But in practice, in the world, they say that you can't try to change a process or change an organization you know, you call up your son's teacher and you want something changed inside their classroom. You need to know what it's like to be inside the classroom. You call up your son, you meet with your son and you want to change a behavior. You need to know what it feels like to be inside his head. And unless you're able to get involved in that level, then you're never going to be able to affect real change. So here's four practical tips that you can do to make positivity part of your daily routine without changing too much of your life. Number one, make sure that whoever you're trying to interact with likes you. If there's one thing that you walk away with from everything I said, it's when you want someone to do something for you, make sure they like you. Whether it's your child, 
right? You want them to go to bed or you want them to do better in class. Make sure there's a relationship there that they care about you, they like you, they're excited about you. Whether it's your son's teacher, you're unhappy with what's happening inside the classroom, you can call up and you can say, this is terrible, how dare you do this? Or you can call up and say, hey, I feel lucky that your son, that you're my son's teacher. And I'm so excited about that. Invest in the relationship, build a better relationship, and then you'll be able to get the world opened up to you. Another practical tip is reframe accusations as questions. So turn around and say, hey, I saw that my son's homework was not graded. I would like to learn more about your process for homework. Or your child comes in and he's, uh, your child comes in and, and he, he did something. And instead of just accepting that you know that he did something wrong, find out, be inquisitive. Let me try to get what was happening inside your mindset. And I'll very often something like that diffuses the situation. The next thing is talk when both of you are calm. It's very easy to talk to a child when we're really upset. But if we're able to, if we're able to um, give the child a chance to calm down, this is super important because the brain physically shuts down. Chemically, the brain shuts down when, 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 when it approaches fear. And then the last part is find the practical alternative. When your children are fighting, or when your child is not doing well, instead of saying to him, stop fighting, stop bothering your sister, turn to, him and turn to them and say, hey, I know that we have this really good game, let's go play this. And the redirecting is a very powerful opportunity to avoid dealing with a painful situation, and later on you have the opportunity to have a conversation and to work things out. You know I'm running over time. We have two other illustrious speakers. Quick story about a soldier in the IDF. Um, I heard this from uh, Rabbi Brisky. Um, this story was floating around a little bit. He said there was this fellow, Kobe Sherman. He was a soldier in the IDF. He was trained to be able to uh, do these missions and these, these uh, very complicated missions. And at some point, he was in the middle of a mission. His job was to s scout for the planes behind him. So he would fly, he would drop a flare where his, his fellow soldiers had to drop bombs, and then when he was done, he would loop back around and come to take pictures to see what the, what the effect was. He was in the middle of a mission over Lebanon, and he began to feel vertigo. But the experience was so intense, now since soldiers are trained to be able to deal with situations like that, this experience was so intense that he didn't even realize he was having it. And as far as he was concerned, his, his plane was pointed upwards and he was in the process of continuing his mission, but really his altitude was dropping and he was leaning towards the ground. The instruments on his plane were turning to him where they were flashing and beeping and he was saying, you're losing altitude, you're losing altitude. But in his mind, he said, well, my plane is on its way upwards. Why is, why is the plane telling me that I'm losing altitude? And he had this quick dilemma in a matter of seconds. Do I trust the plane or do I trust myself? He didn't know what to do and within a split second, he turned on his radio and he radioed to the people behind him, his, his uh, platoon soldiers, his other fellow soldiers that were um, with him. And he said to me, he said to them, am I going up or am I going down? Which direction am I going? And they turned to him and they said, Atayored, Atayored, you're going down. And he was able to take control of the plane and save his life. If there's one thing that we can do to add positivity and to help our children in the effect of you know, it's to build a positive relationship with the people around us, with our schools, with our community, with events like this where people come together to focus on positive things. 
Because in the event that we're not sure what to do, in the event that we're in trouble, in the event that we're having a hard time with something, we can rely on the people around us to save us. Thank you very much.